Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us for So You Think You Know Food. Today we're talking about Italian, French, and Portuguese cuisine, and we have a wonderful panel of expert guests. I'm going to go down the row as I see everybody um, in the little peanut gallery. First, we have Jamie Schler, who is... Um, a wonderful food writer and a blogger at Life's a Feast. Um, she also is the words half of the words and photography blog Plate and Story, which I believe was um, nominated for nice. an IMDb. Fantastic uh, in photography, um, photography based blog. Based blog. Congratulations to you and Ilva both. And um, then we have Domenica Marchetti, who is um, she lives in Virginia, so she's not too far from me, but she is. Um, the queen of Italian cuisine. She's got several <laughs> cookbooks out, and um, so she is definitely an expert in her area. I'm glad that she could join us today. Thank you. And um, we also have David Leet, who is um, the ringleader of Leet's Culinaria. He um, and his blog and podcast have both been nominated for IACP awards. So congratulations on that, David. Thank it's you. fantastic. I'm glad you're here to represent Portuguese cuisine. And then we have Chef Dennis, who everybody knows, who is our tech guru. He's going to be monitoring the comments everywhere and helping us out, keeping us on track. We had about 400 questions for him before we went live. So. Glad to be here, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much. So um, first, I'm going to let everybody go down the line and introduce themselves and talk a little bit about why this topic is of interest to them and why they said yes to this hangout. So Jamie, if you'd go first, that would be great. Well, you actually already introduced me, <laughs> but um, for people who don't know me, I am an American, but I moved to France about a million and a half years ago, it, uh, about 30 years, I've, almost 30 years I've been here, and married to a Frenchman and totally immersed in the culture and the cuisine, and I actually had a lot of preconceived notions before I came here, and I think just marrying into a French family change made me realize that it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, do you want me to s just start with my spiel, Jenny? Um, well, let's let Domenica and David say howdy first, and then I will pose a question, and we will begin. Okay. Thanks. I, I do want to say, sorry, that, that is, as far as French cuisine goes, I think, I think that there's, the myths are, are purposely being perpetuated in countries like the States and, and Great Britain and stuff about French cuisine and it often drives me really crazy because it kind of glosses over it a lot and uh, and makes it into some kind of fantasy so that's why I wanted to do this. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, hi everybody. I'm Domenica Marchetti and this is my first ever Google Hangout. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing so um, I'm grateful for Dennis and Jenny um, and all of the experts. Uh, but I do write Italian cookbooks. I've written five and I have a sixth coming out um, next year. And um, as we all know there are tons of um, misconceptions and preconceived notions about what Italian cuisine is and even in fact if there is something called Italian cuisine because it is in fact a collection of regional cuisines although I do maintain that there is um, something called Italian cuisine I think since the unification of Italy um, and especially the publication of cookbooks like Pellegrino Artusi's book um, that came out in 1891 and Ada Boni's book that came out in 1925. These really kind of um, unified uh, the food of Italy and um, so that's something interesting to talk about just how how do you define a cuisine when there are so many regional aspects to it. That's kind of what I'm interested in and I'm also interested in continuing to bust myths about Italian cuisine like its big portions and very fatty and all carbs. Um, so my last cookbook, The Glorious Vegetables was of Italy, was all about vegetables and their place in the, at the Italian table. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, I am too. And David. Uh, my name is David Leet, and as Jenny said, I am I have a website, Leet's Culinaria, and I am actually doing the Portuguese portion of the program because I am Portuguese, 100% um, Portuguese. My mom 
side of the family, my dad's side of the family, came from the from Portugal, from the Azores, which are the islands about a thousand miles off the coast of Portugal. And I wrote a Portuguese cookbook called um, The New Portuguese Table. And through that process, I came to understand a lot about Portuguese cuisine and my own actually my own prejudices and my own myths and my own beliefs about Portuguese cuisine were kind of blown apart. Um, but the big thing I think that I really want to talk about here is the fact that there really are very few myths and beliefs about Portuguese cuisine because no one really knows about Portuguese cuisine. It's not French, it's not Italian. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what we are as well as uh, what we're not and some of the things that I discovered when I went through the book process. Excellent. This is going to be such a great discussion. Dennis, how are we doing? We are doing great, Jenny. Uh, no questions yet, but guys, if you do have questions for any of our speakers, please leave them in the comment bar, and uh, I promise we'll get to them. Fabulous. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, so why don't we kick this off talking about um, myths versus realities of each of these cuisines. Um, some, of, some of our panelists came to the cuisines um, early in life and some later in life, so it'll be interesting to hear what they thought of the cuisine before they actually were immersed in it. So um, again, from my left to right, um, we'll start with Jamie. I think that my, my preconceived notions, my idea of what French cuisine was, came from two places. First, very young, it came from a French high school class and text, and my very elegant high school teacher taking us into the home ec room and making, uh, taking, you know, popping fresh dough and Hershey's bars and making pain au chocolat in front of us, little crescents with, with chocolate, which I thought was like the be-all and end-all of food. And someone else who made coco vin for a French club dinner. And already to me it was something so sophisticated and so exotic and so elegant and very complicated. Um, and and I mean, there was this already this real mystique about the whole thing. By the time I left for college, and then after college, where I lived in Philadelphia and then New York, and this was the early 80s, mid 80s, and this was uh, Le Bec in Philadelphia, and it was Lutece in New York, and it was all these Le Coup Basque, and, and basically at that time, French cuisine was equivalent to haute cuisine, and Basically, if you wanted something fancy and pretentious and expensive and really wanted to impress people, you went to French restaurants. They were really expensive, all the rage. And so even when all those little little bistros, little French bistros, and I remember all those souffle restaurants and the fondue restaurants, when they opened up, there was already this mystique about French cuisine being really exotic and special and expensive. And I think that kind of swept everything else that was French up into it. Um, I do remember in Philadelphia and New York, all the food shops, we used to go to the food shops, and this is going to kind of feed into Domenica's where, um, preconceived notions, where all of the Italian shops were, all the bakeries, cheese shops, and, and pasta shops were, were very rustic, they were familial, they were, they were casual, and they were pretty affordable for people like me, who was, you know, a poor struggling student. And then you would go to these shops, the butcher shop and things like that in, in New York. And it was like, oh my God, it was fancy. It was really expensive. I mean, for me, it was like the upper, you know, the, the upper class New Yorkers, the rich New Yorkers that could go in and spend a fortune on a little roasted chicken and a little, a little barquette of uh, potatoes, gratin, flan and stuff. Um, and it was very formal and it was very fancy. So this is basically, I think, the kind of um, uh, French cuisine to me has always been put on a pedestal in, in a place like the States, maybe in, in other, other countries as well. And, um, and even just cooking, I mean, I think someone like Julia Child who set out to, to simplify and explain French cooking and bring it into the average home, even someone like me, when I look at her cookbooks, I think, oh my god, this looks so complicated to make, and it's so many ingredients, and it takes all day to make. This is something for special occasions, and some of this stuff, uh, I, I don't even dare making them from her cookbooks. Um, so it's it's the whole, you know, it's, it's fancy, it's expensive, it's complicated, and uh, 
and it's heavy. I mean, I think these are a lot of the myths, and a lot of the pe Americans that I've talked to in my situation who've moved to France pretty much all have these preconceived notions uh, as well about French cuisine. So, um, shall I? Do you want well, to I have I, actually I have a question, um, Jamie. So after you moved to France, I mean, you mm -hmm. discovered that that it was quite different, right? Um, can you talk a little right. bit about what you discovered? And also, um, you know, I've only been to France once. Uh, I wonder if French cuisine is as regional, really, as Italian. I'm curious. Okay, there's two there's two things. There's basically two points about about French cuisine, and I think a lot of it is very close to what it's parallel with Italian in a lot of ways. First of all, I, I married into a very, very humble working class family, and all of a sudden I saw my mother in law and my husband after that making all of these dishes that I mean, even when I look on food blogs and people are making hoof bourguignon and onion soup and you know, it, with exclamation points. It's all very complicated and it's luxurious and it's special occasion food. And here I found that actually French cuisine, all of these dishes were inexpensive. They were easy to put together, not complicated, even if they simmered for a long time. Um, and and so basically that's the first, that's the very humble, it's a very humble cooking because like Italian, a lot of it came from working class or peasant cuisines meant to fill people up in the middle of the day and sustain them so they could carry on and work for another six hours before they came home and had a bowl of soup. Um, and, and a lot of people still cook that way. Um, this, the, two, the two points I think about French cuisine that people don't realize is that first of all, it is synonymous, it's a very frugal and simpl simple cuisine. So those are the two key words, sim simplicity and frugality. Um, and there's the French cuisine is divided, probably like Italian, into these standard, major standard classics. And these are the ones that people abroad know about, all those big standard uh, dishes, which are basically that part that came from kind of, uh, you know, humble stock, the stuff that's made with, you know, these soups and stews and ragouts that kind of simmer for a long time. This is basically stuff that was created to use leftovers or cheap cuts of meat that needed long simmering, cheap vegetables. I mean, you come to France and you're eating, you live in France and you're eating carrots and leeks and potatoes and beans and lentils. I mean, really cheap, cheap, ingre you know, cheap ingredients. The other part is, is that there's that standard cuisine that travels that everyone knows about. And then there's local cuisine. It's a very, very, it's like, it's like Italy. It's really, really local and regional cuisines, which don't travel. People in Nantes don't make bouillabaisse, and people in Marseille don't make gâteau nanté. Um, it's, it, the cuisines of the local areas are, rely, you know, basically rely on, you know, what the local ingredients, the local terroir, the weather, and the local history and traditions. Nantes has um, a combination of um, uh, very, very fine, t fine um, products like asparagus, um, fragile ingredients, uh, um, sea scallops, fish, tomatoes, things like that. But it was also a very wealthy city with a very bourgeois city, which combined make it a very refined, very fresh cuisine. Whereas when you go to places like Lyon or um, or Marseille, it's completely different history and it's completely different products that are there and it's completely different cuisine. And I think because these cuisines don't travel between different regions in France, they don't usually get out to other countries either, which is why most people outside of France base their base French cuisine reputation on those big classics. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I have I have actually a couple of questions about that. I will come back to it though because I want to let Domenica talk about her myths and realities as far as Italian cuisine is concerned. So I grew up in uh, New Jersey. I was born in New York and grew up in New Jersey, but my mother was born and raised in the Abruzzo region of Italy. So um, I grew up with her cooking, which was very much um, what I consider to be authentic Italian versus Italian American. For example, she never made things like you know stuffed shells or um, veal parm or these you know iconic giant meatballs on a plate of spaghetti. And um, but her cuisine was very much um, in the style of, of Abruzzo, which um, 
in itself is has a lot of diversity in its cuisine because it's a region that has mountains, hills, and the coast. So you've got your coastal seafood, and you know every town you go to along the coast has a different variety of brodetto, of, of fish soup. Um, and then you have your mountain cuisine, which consists of lamb and mutton and pork and 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 beef. And um, so uh, so when I was growing up, we really kind of eschewed the whole Italian American um, cooking scene and. Um, I have to say, uh, Italy and America have always had, I guess, some somewhat of a symbiotic relationship with food because um, some ingredients like tomatoes, peppers, um, and others didn't even reach Europe and Italy until after the New World was discovered. So at one point, Italy, or the collection of states that became Italy, um, you know, was a world without tomatoes, and that's kind of hard to imagine in Italian cuisine now. So, um, so our relationship with the New World really goes back a long way. Um, I think uh, in the last few decades, our perception and our understanding of what Italian cuisine is has changed and has um, I think we've become much more knowledgeable so many people have traveled to Italy so many people know that when you're eating a dish of pasta you don't it's not a giant plate of pasta it's not doused in sauce it's tossed lightly um, and uh, you know so you see this in restaurants many restaurants now that that um, there is this effort to really um, uh, represent Italian food authentically um, one of my favorite restaurants is a place in Philadelphia called Le Vertu, and they focus on the cuisine of Abruzzo, and I think they may be the only um, restaurant in the country that does that. And so they are really trying to honor the traditions and the, uh, the foodways of that particular region, and they do a pretty good job of it. And um, But, you know, uh, like anything, you, you also have to serve the people in, in the area that you live. Um, I think... Um, there are still myths that are hard to bust, one of them being that Italian food is heavy, that it's all pasta, that Italians eat a lot, that they are at the table all the time. I mean, that last one is, <laughs> to some extent, I think still true, but not as true as it used to be. And the other thing that's interesting is um, I think about this a lot. I think about whether I am contributing to um, the dissolution of you know, Italian cuisine, because just by virtue of where I live, I live in Virginia, I grew up in the U.S., I write for an American audience, so while I think my books stay true to the spirit oh. of tradition, there are recipes in some of my books that you would never see in, in Italy. Um, that's just reality. Um, so I do, ha I worry about whether I'm perpetuating myths, whether, um, you know, I'm destroying this uh, cuisine that I love so much. Um, and then it, over in Italy itself, there are other issues going on, which is the Americanization of Italian food and the way people are eating. There was a piece in La Repubblica the other day that was um, written by a Canadian uh, writer who has lived over there for a number of years and has noticed that you know, more Italian kids are fat, more Italian kids are eating um, burgers, and they're not developing that Italian palate for, you know, anchovies and capers and those piquant foods. Um, so there's that concern. That's that's a big issue, I think. And um, and then, um, you know, there there's uh, the Internet. Um, a lot of Italian food bloggers. You know, it's a, it's a global village out there. I've gone to Italy, and I, you know, in recent years, and now I see things like muffins and bagels, and um, you know, all these foods that you didn't used to get over there. And you see food bloggers, you know, developing recipes in Italian for um, for these types of foods. So it's a very complicated. Um, interesting issue, and I'd love for others to weigh in on it because. Um, because I, I do think that, that there are a lot of people who love Italian cuisine. I think we all have a slightly different definition of what it actually is. I, I want to make a comment because you you said something about the concept of, of people see Italians as sitting down for a meal in restaurants. But that's a concept they have about French meals, which is kind of true. But the funny thing is, is that the idea behind a French meal that lasts six hours or whatever, three hours, and an Italian meal that lasts three hours 
the visual is completely different. One, like you said, is very it's very heavy and a lot of food and a lot of you know, blah. Yes. And and the French the French concept of sitting for three hours is very elegant and it's slow and it's easy and it's which I find fascinating actually. So that's really interesting, Jamie, because it makes me think of this story that I wrote for the Washington Post um, last, I guess, last month um, about this tradition in Abruzzo that goes back to, I think, the 15th or 16th century called La Panarda. It takes place in the middle of January and is, um, I guess, it coincides with the feast day of St. Anthony the Abbot. But it was really, um, so it's like a two-day feast where people will literally eat, you know, over the course of one day or two days, and they'll eat 40 courses or more. And Labor 2 in Philadelphia did kind of a, a, sh um, a little bit of a shortened version of this where they had a, an incredible nine-hour panarda where they had 40 courses that they served over the course of an afternoon and into the evening. And so I covered it for the Washington Post. And people were like, oh my god, you must have been so full. And, and, and uh, you know, talking about how, what a what a kind of a bacchanal, I mean, you know, just kind of a, um, a uh, overdone um, a tradition it must be. But um, really what it was, it was a couple of things. The celebration of a full larder. You know, here you are in lean months, nothing is growing anymore, but you've put up your preserves, you've made, you've, um, you know, put all your, uh, you've slaughtered the pigs, you've got your, your meats cured, and you were celebrating a full larder. And it was also traditionally a feast that was put on by, um, you know, the nobility for the peasants who had other, you know, in this one or two days whose lives were pretty miserable. And it was kind of a way of thanking them, and everybody came to the table together. So it's steeped in tradition, and it wasn't really about stuffing your face at all. It has a much more, um, you know, uh, uh, it's it's just about um, celebrating life in the face of the harsh winter and in the face of a lot of difficulty. Um, so that's what this um, restaurant did, and and so we talked about you know what this tradition really means, and they served this wonderful meal that was just a few bites each course, and it was really nothing. Um, like what people might have imagined it to be. In it Portugal, <clears throat> excuse me. In Portugal, we have the same, a, a similar thing called a mantança, which it takes place a lot of times in um, in December. Uh, at least with my family, it was in December. And uh, what it is is that's the slaughtering of the pig. Basically, every family has a pig or two in the backyard, and they would slaughter the pig and they would uh, gut it. And back when my father's family was there, uh, it was dirt floors. So after they gut it and cleaned it, it was hanging from the ceiling in the living room of the house. Mm -hmm. And you would invite other people over to see actually all that you have. And we have photographs of the pig hanging there with a long table with Campari bottles and all these different things in which they're going to celebrate. It's funny that the Campari, that there was no equivalent at that point um, after the war for uh, any kind of Portuguese uh, liqueur out in the Azores. And then there started a several day process of breaking down the pig, making sausage, uh, preserving preserving meats. My father had, and I just had a very long discussion about this. And I did an oral history of where they were uh, preserving it in salt, they were preserving it in fat, they were making the sausage, they were uh, dealing with the skin and doing everything as a, as a way to, to, to celebrate the poverty because my family, I come from a family of grinding poverty and this whole area was grinding poverty. Everybody was extraordinarily poor and this was the one time of year that they make something that will stretch out the entire year. So it is it's not really a feast. We have there are feasts uh, that they have on the island, but this is familial ones that will happen, and there is a lot of food that's attendant because it's kicking off the season of actually having a lot of food after after kind of a period of nothing. And so there is those tables that are laden with food, very noisy, very loud. Uh, nothing like you would think, Jamie, or what the the myth is of sort of that a very elegant sitting back in, in this this glorious home of, of French food. This is this is people with you know blood splattered pants sitting in the backyard, you know, eating and drinking and having a great time. So we have that that same sort of casual uh, feasting too. Mm -hmm. 
Very cool. And as, and as long as we're here, you're all big and blue box. David, why don't you go ahead and talk a bit about your Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting, as I had mentioned earlier, the idea about the myths of Portuguese cuisine. I know that we have Sofia Reno, who is Portuguese, and she has a very different background than I. Uh, but there really is, there are no myths, uh, at least in the American public, about Portuguese cuisine. Uh, they don't know Portuguese cuisine. We don't really exist. Uh, I, I, I have... I bet any of you never knew a Portuguese person really until you met me. Maybe you did. I don't know. <laughs> my, well, in, my first in France. In France. In, in France, yes, there There's are a lot there. of Portuguese people. Live, yeah. Uh, my, but most people don't. It's kind of exotic. Yeah. Well, my first introduction to a Portuguese person was Julia Roberts playing a Portuguese girl in Mystic Pizza. So <laughs> and she didn't do that good of a job. Oh, okay? no, I don't think she did. <laughs> and, uh, and so people really don't know a lot about Portuguese cuisine and. Part of that is our own our own fault. Uh, part of it's a, it's a small country. It's a tiny country, right. the size of Atlanta, uh, uh, size of Georgia or Indiana. It's a very small country, one of the smallest in Western Europe. But on top of it, when uh, people emigrated and they came to America or other co or other countries. Uh, you don't eat out. You don't socialize food-wise with other cultures. It's not what you do. It's it's not a way of feeling superior. It's actually an insult to your family if you decide that you want to go to a Chinese restaurant. I ate out for the first time at a restaurant, a sit-down restaurant, when I was 12 years old, and that was a Chinese restaurant. And it's just something that you don't do. So we kept food very interior. So a lot of people ask me, why aren't there more Portuguese bakeries or Portuguese butchers or Portuguese restaurants? It's because we didn't do that. It wasn't, um, you know, the people who came to America tended to be people from the Azores, which was the poorest of the poor. And they were really skilled fishermen and skilled, uh, and the women were skilled in, in sewing and they were skilled in a lot of uh, that, those kind of uh, skills. So they went to places where there were fabric mills like Fall River, which is where I grew up, and New Bedford where there's whaling, or out in Hawaii or out in California. And they remained in that. So there really isn't a lot of myth out there. Now there's a lot of personal myth, uh, which I'd like to talk about because I grew up in a home that served Azorian cuisine. Now Azorian cuisine is very hearty cuisine. It's cuisine um, a peasant very well most of Portuguese cuisine as Jamie had said too and I think uh, Domenica you touched upon it is, is peasant cuisine. A lot of it is peasant cuisine but for me, I thought all of Portugal was like that. I thought everybody ate thick gross octopus stew you know, with the big tentacles, mm -hmm. uh, tentacles. <laughs> and I thought that everybody had these slabs of really salty, gross salt cod um, and soups that were just laden with all these uh, green vegetables, especially kale um, or collard greens. We, I grew up eating kale, not collards. And I was shocked when I went to Portugal and I, I was started to travel. My first stop was the Azores, so that really... Um, edified what I was believing. I really it, it 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 reinforced my beliefs about what I was seeing. Then I went to the mainland, and they ate completely different. Uh, a lot of the dishes in the in the Azores do not exist in the mainland, or if they do, they exist in such different forms that that you can't even you, you can barely see the lineage. And I saw a lot more variety because there's more more things going on there uh, in the mainland as far as cultures and, and, and I, I culture it as climates and microclimates so you would see uh, there's a lot of sheep and there's a lot of goat there as, as opposed to the the islands where there's a lot of cows so there's a lot of uh, beef there and there's a lot of uh, cow's milk cheese but in the mainland you don't see a lot of cow um, a lot of milk uh, cow's milk cheese you see a lot of goats or sheep's milk cheese and there was a lot more elegance, I think, to some of it, of course, because you have Lisbon and you have Porto and you have uh, and the Algarve. So I was blown away by this, and I was blown away by the fact that some of the dishes my mother and grandmother had made and I grew up eating, other people made better. That that never crossed my mind, that somebody could make what my family made better. And it was a revealing thing for me to understand that, oh, my gosh, there's a whole country out there that does not eat exactly as we do. Um, and I was looking here at some of the notes as I was going on uh, and listening to what you were saying. Like for some of the stories I grew up with too, I also romanticized a lot of the poverty, which was I think unfair to my family. Uh, my, my father was one of the youngest uh, ever to kill an octopus because uh, they kind of hide out in underwater grottos and he actually used a bamboo stick and got them uh, and killed it. 
And, uh, you know, he was considered a hero on the island because he was that young and he was already fending for his family. And, uh, and so that to me was this romanticized thing. And when I got there and I actually understood more of what the poverty was, it was, I, I was kind of embarrassed that I, 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 I could have made a Hollywood movie out of it, you know. And, um, and, and so some of those beliefs, uh, they, they just, they fell apart when I started writing the book. And then I started seeing the variety that was there. And I started seeing the, um, uh, the quality that you see even in the mainland, even in, in the island too, uh, the islands. But what's interesting too that, that I find fascinating is that when people emigrate to a new country, their food freezes they just, everything freezes for them. So if they left in the 50s, like when my father left in the late 50s, whatever cuisine was going on then is what my family is eating now. Nothing has progressed for them. That's and when you go back to that same place, people, it's what Domenica was talking about. There's right. bagels, there's other things. Right. Some of them are other cultures, and some of them are just people have found different ways of doing things because there's more money now with those same ingredients. That's a great point and it m reminds me of uh, so olive oil which didn't used to be throughout Italy and, and other dishes and other ingredients um, you know like the, the sort of stereotype is that in the north they use butter, butter in the south they use olive oil but throughout Italy now I think most cuisine is made with olive oil because it's healthier and that's what people you know want to cook with and, exactly. and want to eat now um, but of course over here I think that's such a great point about cuisine being frozen because um, what we think of it or what the general public maybe not necessarily those of us immersed in the food world but a lot of the general public still think of Italian cooking the way it was when the those first waves of immigrants came over all those you know uh, generations ago mm -hmm. exactly and then Asha has said that you know actually Portuguese were very active colonizers and we were uh, and we had a tremendous number of colonies. I want to say 14 or 17 colonies throughout the world. But one of the things that really didn't happen was a lot of that food did not come back to Portugal. It remained out there. Um, and we colonized those areas. And a lot like, for instance, um, uh, Vina Values, which is garlic and, and wine together, is what has become in India, oh gosh, um, it's going to come to me. It's a very hot dish. Very, very, very incredibly spicy and I can't think what it's called. Um, and like Vindaloo so, or something? Vindaloo, thank That's you very much. That's what I was going to say. Vindaloo is our Vigne Values. And ah, they took that, that and they created oh. it out of their own local ingredients. It's only been in the 20th century that I have seen, or at least from my understanding, that a lot of restaurants came back but a lot of the colonies um, when, when Portuguese gave up a lot of the colonization and then the countries went back to, to, to being their own countries, uh, not being going back, but being their own countries, uh, then you started seeing Angolan restaurants in Lisbon. You started seeing Mozambique restaurants in Lisbon. You started mm -hmm. seeing uh, Cabo Verde, Cape Verde restaurants. So those foods now have, have kind of come back to roost. The same way you've got the Indian cuisine that came back to, to England and to London, uh, you know, 100 years ago. That's what we're starting to see now. So there's all this incredible infusion of of the reach that Portuguese cuisine had. Because I was also very surprised too. In the uh, this is busting the myth that I'm thinking that Portuguese was very pl Portuguese cuisine was very plain, uh, very very peasanty, very heavy. Was the rich spices that we brought back from the spice trade because we were in charge of the spice mm -hmm. trade for the longest time. Then the Dutch followed us and, and, and so forth. Uh, but we brought back so much. I knew more of the stuff that came from South America because they stopped back on the way to the Azores. So the use of some of the peppers, the use of allspice, that stuff came to the Azores on its way to Lisbon. The other stuff didn't really come through to the Azores. So it's interesting that all these other spices that I never grew up with, I was very surprised to see. I never had cilantro in, Portu in Portuguese cuisine. That was anathema. You, you never had it, and it's very big in Portugal. I mean, I, I think that kind of overlaps with what we were saying. I mean, I see, I see a city like Nantes that used to be one of Europe's biggest uh, ports, and it was a major, uh, a major corner of the, a major point of the of the slave trade triangle. And so you had all the products from the French West Indies, uh, rum and almonds and, and spices and vanilla that, and sugar, sh sugar cane I guess, that came through Nantes and it pretty much, a lot of it stopped in Nantes. I mean you have Babo rum which was created in Paris, but all of those things influenced the Nantes cuisine 
but mm. because it's so regional um, and so local and things like foods don't really travel mm -hmm. it's still a heavy influence on our cuisine but not really elsewhere interesting mm. interesting it, even <laughs> even go ahead well, because things are but but the, the other thing I want to it's funny because I'm thinking about uh, the huge Portuguese population that's come to that's come to France and as you're talking about that it's funny because in all the years that we lived in Paris, I think we saw one Portuguese restaurant. There were no, I don't remember food shops, maybe it's different now in Paris, but I don't remember food shops or bakeries or anything. There was one Portuguese restaurant that we ate at that was fabulous, and it was a very elegant, light cuisine. In, um, in Paris, Portuguese? It was outside Paris, in fact. It wasn't even in Paris, it was outside, but it was, yeah. Well, you know what's interesting? One of the points I wanted to make, too, and Asha, thank you very much. I didn't realize that the uh, it was the British plantations who uh, bastardized um, Vindaloo and made it spicier, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, it's a comment that was left on the page. Uh, was one of the things that for the longest time, talking about how there's the idolization of French cuisine, for a long time in Lisbon, in the turn of the uh, 20th century, so just the Belle Epoque, well not Belle Epoque era, but the 1890s, 1900s, uh, everything was very Frenchy. There was just a real Frenchified mm -hmm. approach to cuisine uh, back then because the hotels and that, and that whole thing. So I don't know if there was any kind of carryover from that or if there was a um, uh, maybe a, a French applied way of handling some of these Portuguese ingredients because when you go to a, a true Portuguese grandma and grandpa call it Tashka, or Tashkina, Tashkina, uh, which is a little mom and pop run restaurant. It's it's nothing like light and and small dishes. It's big boiled potatoes and fish and grilled meats and and very much the Actually, stuff that I now that you with. now that you mentioned that there was one like that. There was one like that, and it was um, bacala. Is that what is was that? What we said bacalao. Bacalao. Oh wow, well, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Close. <laughs> Bacalao's and Italian. It was, it was, Right, it was. Oh, right. Okay, it was. It was very. It was very heavy rustic food. You're right. Which compared, contrasted to the other one. Well, I find that the whole. What's funny is that what's funny. What's what, what's uh, sorry. What's funny is that in the 18, 1880s, 1890s, was the what changed um, French cuisine as well, and that maybe why maybe the French started to travel more, and they were doing that because um, that's when uh, the the whole upper this. French upper middle class, the class of bourgeois, was created actually. I think this is, pro we were going to talk about Americanization of these cuisines, but it's been really interesting listening to this conversation because the cuisines are changing on a global level too. You know, it's not always about America. And, and so I'd like maybe everybody to to touch upon um, global influences um, and if you live in America of course you talk about American influences but also the interplay among these cuisines elsewhere like you know, David and Jamie are talking about Portuguese like the French influence on Portuguese cooking that sort of thing and then Dennis you're welcome to jump in as well as a trained chef to um, look at these cuisines um, from an American chef who might have had to make those foods as well. So if anybody wants to just jump in on that, that would be great. We have about 20 minutes or so. Well, just talking about Portuguese, uh, because there is there was so much traveling, where we were considered the world's navigators for a long time. Uh, there are there are stories, uh, there's some fact pointing to them, there's some fact pointing against them, but people believed, some people believe that we brought the concept of tempura to um, the East because of some of the cooking that we do. Some people think that actually we brought it back to the West from the East. Um, I know that, for instance, Macau, uh, they have uh, the, egg, the egg tartlets that we uh, have in Portugal, the pistache, the nata, which are huge, but they do theirs slightly different. Um, so there is a, a Portuguesization of the world in some of the colonies, but I think that there is also coming back I'm seeing it now a lot when you go to Portugal of it coming back to Portugal and uh, and as far as the Americanization or uh, of you had asked about that right Jenny the Americanization mm -hmm. that I, I don't really see a lot of Americanization of Portuguese food uh, what I find is the 
Portuguesization of American food or other cuisines, meaning we have, there's such a thing as Portuguese pizza, which is nothing more than pepperoni pizza without pepperoni, but with our sausage on it. It's the same exact thing. Or we will find, wherever you find uh, a hot sausage or a spicy sausage, we will swap it out, put in, and people will swap it out, put in Portuguese sausage, and they call it a Portuguese chowder, or they call it a Portuguese uh, soup or something like that. And so there, it's very interesting that um, I don't see it being watered down. And I think part of it might be because there was such that close-knit quality of, of our our ancestors um, when they first came to America. Uh, but that's what I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing more. And still, we're very, I don't want to say we're a marginalized culture, because we're not. We're just a very, 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 very small percentage of the American public. and We're, we're not huge. Um, and so I'm not really seeing a lot of that happen. I'm, just, I'm seeing people playing with stuff at home. When I go back, you'll see Portuguese ingredients put into anything. Um, but that's in, in pockets. Mm -hmm. um, I think of one interesting example of, I guess, um, Italians' global influence. I mean, I have, I know that Italian food is very popular in places like Japan and um, that I've never been to. Um, so I can't really say, you know, if I were to go to an Italian restaurant in Japan, what kind of experience I would have. But um, a few years ago, I went to, um, there is a sizable Ethiopian community here in the D.C. area, and um, I went to an Ethiopian restaurant with my family, and lo and behold, there on the menu was spaghetti, and it was very different from the spaghetti or the pasta that you might get in Italy, or even in the U.S. It was overcooked, and the sauce was very thick, and really spicy because it included the spices that they use in Ethiopia. And of course this dates back to that brief period where Ethiopia was a colony um, of Italy during um, you know, Mussolini's reign. And, um, and so I thought that was just fascinating and I'm sure you know, the geopolitical food, um, uh, geopolitization of food could be a whole other discussion, but, um, but that I think is an interesting mm -hmm. example of um, you know what happens to a cuisine when it meets a you know a different um, culture. Um, as for Americanization, um, one of my favorite examples comes from the or, or just how food is traveled. Um, so you know, porchetta is very big, you know, roast pig. Um, here in in the United States, I think there's a restaurant in New York called Porchetta, and there are porchetta trucks and stuff. Well, you know, the original porchetta trucks date back um, to at least a century, or if not longer. Um, and there are these trucks that go throughout the hills of Abruzzo, and every day they, you know, you know that on Friday, if you're in the town of Vicente, the porchetta truck's going to be there from, you know, 9 a.m. to noon or whatever, and you can go get your porchetta sandwich and your um, whatever you want. And um, so uh, I, I've got this cookbook that um, I'm going to hold up for people to see. It's, it's pretty old. I've had it for a long time. It's called Savoring the Seasons of the Northern Heartland. So it's kind of Midwestern cuisine and um, Northern Mid Midwestern cuisine. I used to live in Michigan and in Iron Mountain there's a sizable um, population of Italian Americans. And so I came across this recipe some years ago called porchetta and it's spelled P-O-R-K-E-T-T-A rather than P-O-R-C-H-E-T-T-A. And the head note says, Porchetta is of Italian origin, but this garlic-studded, fennel-flavored, long-cooked roast has been adapted by everyone, Finn, Norwegian, and Cornish alike, who grew up on the Iron Range, the iron mining area of northern Minnesota. Um, I just think that's uh, wonderful, that this dish, this recipe, um, this food could travel from the mountains of Abruzzo to the mountains of northern Minnesota and Michigan and, um, you know, become something, uh, you know, with obviously um, traces of what it once was, but then all these other influences added to it. And I think that's the wonderful thing about American cuisine. I, I, just, I just spoke to a, a chef here who many years ago was in uh, was the head chef of a, re a French restaurant in New Orleans in the 80s and he said to me that when he was preparing the menus for what they were going to cook there he said there were two things the Americans wanted exactly what they thought French cuisine was 
what they were supposed to get in the French restaurant, restaurant the foie gras and the, uh, whatever, the Cointreau souffle and the onion soup. But this time eliminated a lot of stuff that he knew they would never eat, like anything made with frogs. Um, so I think when it comes to French cuisine, I think because it's it's the flip side maybe of Italian and, and, and Portuguese in that it's been put on such a high pedestal that Americans, uh, I mean talking about Americans because I'm American and I watch what's going on in the American community, I think that they do have this very, very set idea and want it to stay pure as possible. Um, but I think, think there's a separation between restaurant aim, which they really want to be what they consider authentic, um, and, and home cooking. And the home cooking, I see all these cookbooks coming out by, by Americans who either spend some time in France or who live in an expat kind of community or live on the common stay for a and stay on the fringe of the, of the society. And they go back and create these, these dishes. And I think what, to me, what I'm seeing is not so much that they're taking French food and changing and adapting French food, is that through that, they're kind of recre recreating, they're perpetuating the myth of the French themselves and of the country and of the way they eat. I see these cookbooks coming out with fabulous recipes, but they have very little to do with really how people are cooking in France. But all these cookbooks are saying this is what's happening in France. And instead of just saying these are fabulous French-influenced meals, it's like these are what the French are cooking, which is not always true. So I think when it comes to French cuisine, I think it's more of wanting to kind of hold on to this magic that is France and what they imagine the French cuisine is and and carrying it somewhere else and kind of, you know, putting it up on a big screen. Um, so, I mean, if people want to put whatever they want to put in quiche and, you know, make cronuts and stuff, um, you know, I'm not sure the French really care. The French themselves, when they go out, to when they open restaurants in the States, and in here, I think that, that no matter how people think of French cuisine, when you really get to know what's going on in restaurants and when you talk to chefs, you realize that no matter how contemporary it is, it isn't really straying very far from the traditions, the food that their grandmother, every time you talk to a French chef about his influences in the kitchen, he'll immediately say, my grandmother. So you know that they're not really straying from that. So it's basically more... Um, adaption in, 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 through cookbooks and magazines um, for the home cook in the States, uh, which to me is kind of tied to this belief of wanting to believe that this is how, uh, how the French are as people. You know, Jamie, it's, it's interesting you're talking about the influence of a lot of chefs saying their grandmother or perhaps their mother. I get that too when I speak to a lot of Portuguese chefs. It is their family, it is their grandmother who are the inspiration. But it's different because, uh, of course, history is different for each of our, our countries. Under Salazar, under Salazar's rule, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't this dispersion of, of an encouragement for chefs to go out to other parts of the world, learn something, come back, and bring what you've got. It was very much kept to the country. And so... Uh, when you know Salazar uh, was uh, left and had just deposed and and the country went back uh, and all this this movement started to happen uh, what you see is a lot of these younger chefs like Enrique Sapasoa or uh, Fausto Arialdi uh, who were some of the top chefs in at least in Lisbon uh, have and, and Jose Avelage went out and learned something. They studied other places to bring things back. So they're still connected to their grandmother. They're still connected to their heritage, but they've never had the ability or, or money or freedom to do a lot of spinning, to do a lot of uh, creating. So I think this is a, an incredible time when you go to some of the larger cities, for instance, like Lisbon, you can get a seven and eight course, ten course meal, which you never used to be able to get. That didn't exist. That kind of dining was not something that you would do, uh, you know, 50, 80, 100 years ago, uh, with the exception of that kind of French influence that uh, I had mentioned earlier. And and then people are experimenting with with not so much different ingredients because people in Portugal are in love with their ingredients. It's blindingly fresh seafood. The pork products are exquisite. Um, mm -hmm. But what they're doing is things that are, are, are new and, and, and a lot of it is different. 
And I think, to me, I'm excited by that because I don't think that a cuisine should ever be frozen in time. Mm -hmm. um, I think there should always be a nod and an understanding and an appreciation and a respect for the past, but I think it also has to continue to grow. And I think because there hasn't been some of those same political and socioeconomic is socio issues for France the way it has been for like Portugal, uh, there is that... that um, there's that that adoration and that wanting to mimic and that wanting to 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 um, to, to be like uh, a lot of the French chefs or a lot of the French cuisine and make that where for us it's about expanding and, and growing and learning and learning new things. David, do you find that there's more uh, items available now for your chefs in Portugal? I mean, even though you say they're not uh, leaving Portuguese ingredients behind, that they're mm -hmm. still in love with those. Are they finding all of the ingredients that they may have struggled to find at one mm -hmm. time just because of availability? Are there things more available now in a whole I th these, in these areas? I think that there are a lot of ingredients that are more available now because there's just better economic conditions, although I mean, Portugal right now is in terrible economic condition based upon under the dictatorship. Um, and so I think that there is some of that that you start seeing being put into just in, in restaurants also and people eating uh, at home. Uh, but also there's this, there are these these other things that people bring in. Like you talk about, uh, Domenico, you talked about uh, spaghetti. Mm -hmm. uh, pasta is huge in Portugal. You know, we call it pasta. Uh, and it's huge. <laughs> and, and, you know, they're putting all kinds of sausages and everything. So there is... Um, at least in my mind, from what I see, Dennis, and I haven't been in a couple of years, so I can't give you the up-to-date, up-to-date, but I have seen that there has been um, more curiosity. Uh, uh, Adrian for, uh, um, for Ron Adria did so much for Portuguese cuisine, and I think he's not really acknowledged, because it got a lot of Portuguese people thinking, wait a minute, if the Spaniards can do this, we can do this too. We can do different things. We can think out of the box. Um, you know, David, that's actually happening in Italy too. I see a lot of reinvention of traditional dishes. I'm thinking of a couple of meals I had this past summer, and even the reinvention of Italian cucina povera, you know, the poor man's cuisine. Um, in Abruzzo, there's a dish called... Um, uh, polpette caccia uova, and it's basically meatballs without the meat made out of breadcrumbs, cheese, and egg. And um, it, you can go to some fairly fancy restaurants now, and you'll get served, you know, these big, beautiful white bowls. You'll have your little um, polpette in, in the center of the bowl, and, you know, with a little bit of sauce, very, very beautifully presented, and, right. and not cheap. And um, so I, uh, you know, I see what you're talking about. People are looking to reinvent, and, um, and yeah, cuisine is never, it, it's always evolving. It's always changing, and obviously it's always borrowing from the past. Um, and, and like I said before, the, you know, with the internet, I mean, everything is so interconnected now. Um, I feel these influences everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, you know, I, I have this experience that um, I kind of think it's cyclical in the sense that um, in that period of time where, where haute cuisine, French cuisine was like, you know, uh, really fancy and a lot of foie gras and, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, where chefs were moving towards something like the Nouvelle Cuisine. It was really fancy and expensive ingredients. I think they're coming back around. I mean, in France, you see a lot of them now in, in uh, bringing in um, uh, Japanese influences and influences from, from Vietnam and from, from the East, mostly. Uh, a lot of spices before it was probably Moroccan stuff. I still think that they're... Um, I think I was going to forget what I was going to say. I still think they're getting back at the same time, they're getting back to something basic, so they're moving away from the fancy ingredients. I mean, you see chefs in France now coming back. They're using all of those outside influences in the herbs and the spices, but they're using things like sardines, and right. they're using the poor, the more humble, poor ingredients right. that is yeah. from our poor cuisine um, in France. So uh, a few, a couple of years ago, I started seeing all these chefs starting to make um, blanquette, vieux blanquette which is a typical, you know, grandmother's dish. Um, of course, deconstructed and reconstructed and everything. But I think it's almost like the same time that they're moving forward in time and being more and more and more contemporary, at the same time to kind of hold on to who they are and their, and their, and their, and their 
what's the word I'm looking for? They're coming back and they're and they're going back to basics. Well, now. I think in order to reinvent, you have to know what you're reinventing, and you have to go back to what the originals are and the local ingredients and the local techniques to understand how you're going to do something. It's sort of like, uh, you know, in, in any study, you have to know the classics in, in order for you to do something else, uh, whatever, it, music or mm -hmm. anything like that. Right, and I yeah. know that um, Fausto Arialdi had a restaurant called Pragma, which is now closed, but he had this huge database of classic recipes from his family. And the only way a chef working with him or even a cook uh, he, because it was very democratic, could create a dish. Was they had to go into the database, find a classic, and then go work it and find a way that you can still have all the strains of Portuguese cuisine, but then done something that perhaps had not been done before. And so I think that it people are very frightened that if we keep doing this, we're going to lose our heritage. And somehow I think that actually it strengthens our heritage. I think that it actually roots us deeper in what we have, what has come before, because we are we're studying it more, we're understanding it more, and then we're making conscious choices to do something different. Not not the 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 uh, forced upon choices that my family had to make when they came to America and they couldn't find certain clams or they couldn't find for certain cuts of pork or beef or they couldn't find certain ingredients and then they had to substitute something else because they were geographically it was something different. These people are back where they are in their homeland making conscious choices to make a conscious split from something that they've done before but they're understanding it more. From a chef's viewpoint, David, you know, I, yeah. I think too, you know, what you're saying, uh, like when I go out to eat, I may try something exotic and new and really intricate, but when I eat at home or when I'm cooking for myself, I go back to the very basic, simple foods. Mm -hmm. I think what you see is a lot of chefs, you know, don't eat that way. They may prepare this meal for, for you when you come in to blow your mind and just really sweep you off your feet, but when they sit down to eat, they go back to their roots and they eat. I think a lot of them are saying, you know, if I'm enjoying this, why can't I share this with my people, my mm -hmm. people that come in? And and they're reestablishing their roots. And I think you'll see that because you know we went off in a whole other direction there for a while. And as they reestablish their roots, then we're going to bring in a whole new wave of a fusion type of cooking where they're experimenting with other ingredients, changing the basic again. That'll go in one direction, and then the next waves of chefs will go back to their roots right, and eat the simple right. meals, and it'll start all over again. It's, it's cyclical. And you know we've what? because of uh, of the availability of products throughout the world now you know it's mm, we've opened a up point. a whole new world and with something like this I mean I have a friend in Milan that I talk to regularly and you know with something like this and he can tell me what he's eating for dinner and what he's using what he's making and he might even send some to me in the States or I might find it so you know you've changed the game completely yeah, yeah. absolutely well, I, I talked to this this Michelin star chef in Nantes who's Proteges, I guess, the people who train the young the young chefs who trained in this kitchen are now opening up restaurants, and they're all opening up instead of these kind of really fancy restaurants, they're opening these um, like gastronomic bistros, and they're and they're, they're the food they're serving is is simplified, and when, after I talked to him, I always thought it was this conscious choice, but he said, you know. Uh, a lot. Part of the reason they're doing this is because of because of money, because of the economic situation. They can't afford to do what I did 25 years ago with mm -hmm. this fancy restaurant, and so it's almost like some of what's going on in Europe now is they're reinventing this stuff and they're producing this new kind of cuisine because, on one hand, they're really constrained to do it. They're forced to do it because they can't do the whole fancy stuff again. Um, so it's like, what can I do with a sardine, which is like the cheapest, most lo you know, local cheapest ingredient? What can I do with a sardine? Um, raise it up to dizzying heights. But well, you know, but, Jamie, I think it's interesting because I think there's this trickle down cuisine that's happening. Also, if you look at an America, <clears throat> you look at America, and I'm only saying that because this is where we live. Uh, look at the number of books that are uh, out there on smoking, on curing, on making your own sausage, on preserving foods. Uh, it's I mean, and that's what I'm getting very much into. I, I'm making my own Portuguese sausage, which I'm the only one of my generation in my family that does it. But not only do I want to carry it on, but I can't get that kind of ingredient 
out here the way that I want it. In Danbury, they do have it, which is near me in Connecticut. But it's not the same same kind of quality or same kind of taste. But there's also the appreciation and there's also the love of being able to create these ingredients. But I think part of it is financially, uh, financially uh, uh, propelled, that they realize that it's, number one, they can get better quality. They can make it themselves. They can charge more for it because they're making it themselves. Um, but also, it's, it's, it is cheaper. But I think that there is, there is that pendulum swing that's happening, Dennis. Um, you know, I don't really want to eat food that has been flown in fresh, a fish that's been flown in fresh from Indonesia. I really don't want to eat that. The carbon footprint bothers me. The fact that it's, it's, it's not local bothers me. Um, and so I, I think that there's something very interesting happening um, that harkens back to all of our roots and all of how our ancestors cooked. Yeah, I think I think really if you um, you honor the cooking techniques that and apply them to local ingredients, then that's the best of both worlds. Well, I talk, I talk, all these all right. these young chefs that have been open, opening restaurants here in Nantes in just the past, there's been an influx of, of these uh, young chefs opening restaurants just in the past five years, and you talk, and ask them all why. I mean, why not? Um, and they all say primarily it's because of the ingredients that we can get here that come to our door every morning fresh. But so what, what's happened in this country with all of the farmers markets that we all have access to now? Um, you know, you can get a, a, a lot of the vegetables that you know my mom had a hard time finding. Um, you know, she'd have to go to the Italian market in Trenton, New Jersey, to get a lot of stuff. And and now I can find a lot of this stuff at my weekly farmers market. I mean, fennel used to be pretty hard to get. Rapini. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all these different heirloom kinds of tomatoes and peppers and carrots and um, you. You know, uh, I just did a piece on for my blog on puntarelle, which are a uh, type of chicory. And um, my sister and I grew up spending our summers in it in Italy. Part of that in Rome. And in all of these years, my sister had never heard of puntarelle, which are typically. Um, Romans eat them in February because that's when this thing grows in the countryside outside of Rome, this, this chicory. And my sister had never heard of Puntarella and the reason is she had never been to Rome, you know, in, in the middle of winter. That's how local, uh, you know, and seasonal the, the cuisine really is. But, um, you know, now there's this company in California that's trying to um, spread the word about radicchio and chicories and I happen to love that bitter flavor and um, so, you know, I'm hoping if I tell my farmer that the farmers market um, maybe next season he'll grow it for me I mean that's the point where we've reached and I think it's wonderful this this has been a fascinating conversation that could go on forever but I'm gonna have to draw us to a close because we're just at over an hour right now oh my goodness. I, I know it went really really quickly um, I think it's been fascinating I hope anybody who's been watching has enjoyed it as well Dennis does anybody have anything to say out there on the event page or anywhere uh, there were some questions and they were mostly for Jamie so Jamie if you can go back I know we're out of time and address the questions in the comments section that would be great and I got one from Sophia and one from Asha for you uh, so They'll when, be on the comments on the comments page on the event page. Yes, they will. So, on the page. Okay, and any of you watching, if you have any other questions, you know, leave them there, and I'm sure our guests in the panel will come back later and check them out and see, and um, you know, they'll give you answers if they can, or you can always message them too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for taking the time to join in this discussion. It's something that Jamie and I have been discussing for quite a while, and we thought, let's bring in some more experts on other cuisines. And it's it's been even a richer discussion than I had hoped that it would be. It's been wonderful. So if anybody has just a little bit of, like, go down the line, a little bit of um, wrap-up, couple of sentences, whatever, say goodbye. <laughs> and, um, so Jamie, all the way down the line. Oh gosh, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how to wrap this up. Um, I, I don't know how to wrap this up. I just, okay. I just want people to understand that, that, that France is much like Italy and Portugal and Spain and, and all of these, I guess, Latin European countries where it's, it's really a cuisine that's so much more simpler than you think. Um, that's, that's a few ingredients put together and that's it. Um, it's frugal. It's inexpensive. It's um, and it's all in the presentation, really. <laughs> that French style, right? 
I mean, even my husband, he makes something. I'm an American. I put stuff on the table in the pot. I mean, he will sit and he'll put it on a platter and he'll fan it out and he'll, I mean, that's, you know. Right. You eat with your eyes first. Wonderful. Thanks. Exactly. Thank um, I I just want to say thank you. This has been really exciting. Um, I, you know, I I just joined Google Plus, so I'm still navigating my my way around. But I I do hope that, I, like I said, I think our our perception of Italian cooking has really changed um, in the last couple of decades. I think it still has a long way to go. And um, you know, I hope people will just keep in mind that it's not about um, are not all about cheese and starch and and giant portions. That it is. Um, you know, cuisine based in, in like Jamie said with French, it's frugal, it's it's simple, and um, you know the pleasures of the table are are really important to the Italian people. Um, so anyway, thank you. I love that the pleasures of the table. Thanks, Domenica, David. Sure, and I just wanted to say thank you to the panel and to Jenny and um, and uh, and to Je Jenny and Jamie and Domenica and Dennis for putting this together. I really appreciate it and for asking me. And also, I thank you to some of the uh, some of our readers or some of our, our viewers. You know, Asha and Sophia. For I've learned a couple of things, which I think is also wonderful. The thing that I want to leave people with is that Portuguese cuisine actually is far more varied and far more um, uh, colorful than maybe some people think, certainly what I thought when I was growing up. And uh, there's a whole panoply of flavors and a whole panoply of textures and ingredients there that uh, are making up this wonderful, very old, old cuisine and culture. And I encourage anyone to go to Portugal. I think you would be very surprised at what you see these days. Sounds like it. Thank you, David. Dennis, do you have anything you'd like to say? No, I'm just uh, thank you for having me on today. It was a pleasure, and I was just intrigued and and just really listened to everybody uh, speaking about their cuisines. And as a, from a chef's viewpoint, you know, it was really fun to hear. And um, and I hope we do this again. Yeah, I, I hope that we do too. There's certainly plenty to talk about. Oh my so, gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add that that I know that Jenny and I had, and even Domenica when we met up, um, had talked about. I mean, there's so many different facets to the same conversation that if if any people want us to, to, to come at it from a different angle and talk about uh, you know different perceptions about different different aspects of the food and the eating and the and the how people behave and how people really cook in truth and stuff, just leave comments and leave suggestions and questions and opinions on the on the events page so we can organize the next one. Absolutely. All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody who watched, and thank you, panel, Jamie, Domenica, David, Dennis. Um, couldn't have had this without you. I've just been sitting here for an hour staring at my screen. <laughs> my pleasure, Jenny. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. All right. You guys have a wonderful day, and Hi, hopefully you too. we'll talk about So You Think You Know Food again soon. Okay. Take care, everyone. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.